Hi, everyone. Welcome back. A new lesson. A new Princeton squash t-shirt. Can you believe I have this many? We have a different topic today. I hope you like it. I like it. It's a quantitative lesson today, but we start with some kind of fun images, I hope, especially for my non-technical students who are perhaps nervous about some structural lingo. Let's simplify everything. Oh, one image that other authors have used is the idea of a single story skeleton. And everybody knows what a skeleton is. It's the framework that holds up the body. They're truly three-dimensional forms, but when we are looking at them from the floor of the building, looking up at these arches, here we are in uh, the Philadelphia Skating Club and Humane Society. Look that up. Uh, built by Anton Tedesco, my main man. There's windows in the back there. That's really cool because he did that at Hershey, but they made him cover up the windows because the players were complaining that the ice was soft. But in Philadelphia, nobody's complaining about that. It's gorgeous. Go look at it. Go ice skate there and commune with the spirit of Tedesco. When you're skating there and you're looking at those curvilinear forms, you can call them arches. You can call them arches. Now, other people will use other lingo, such as a gabled frame or a pitched frame, but I think the easiest thing is to call it an arch. Even in the 19th century, designers understood the power of the arch. Not intuitively did they understand that, but they understood it mathematically. This is uh, the Galerie de Machine, Machine, sorry, Galerie de Machine. It was by uh, Victor Corteman. And it's really impressive. The, the spans of this structure, you've seen perhaps railway stations. Um, sometimes you see it in, in sports facilities like we just saw at Hershey uh, made out of concrete. Uh, well, we saw it in Philadelphia. Look around when you're traveling. Look at these magnificent arches. Now, one of the things that you may or may not have thought about before is this idea of span. How much horizontal distance do we cover with the arch? And rise, how much do they go from the ground floor? And remember, we are looking at an individual arch and we're looking at it in two dimensions. And that's what we call uh, the elevation view, the elevation view. And I think that's a perhaps a confusing idea for students who've never done this before. Well, how could a two-dimensional model be at all sufficient for a three-dimensional structure? And the answer is we got lucky, right? Because in the 19th century, not sure what we would have done if it was really a fully 3D problem. It turns out it, it is a two-dimensional problem. The other issue that I want to bring up that is not covered in this course, but just briefly on this slide, is how do you decide what is the rise and what is the span? And that is from programmatic issues. For instance, you're in a train station. How high must it be the rise? such that the fumes of your belching locomotive must be adequately exhausted. Or you're kicking a ball or hitting a bird, birdie or um, something, and how much rise do you need so that the arch is not interfering with the game itself? 
Those are programmatic issues, so-called architectural issues that we won't cover in this course, but we will cover something that I'm pretty sure many of you have never thought about, and that is the giraffe on ice. The giraffe on ice. And as soon as you see that image, you know exactly what I'm talking about. A giraffe with its spindly legs is standing on ice and there's no wind or anything, and we only have the self-weight of the giraffe, the legs want to sprawl outwards. The legs want to spread apart. Something must buttress those legs inward. We can call that thrust. You can call that a buttressing effect. But it is present even if we only have downward loads. Uh, the flying buttress is an example of something containing the nave of these magnificent Gothic cathedrals, even though there's only gravity load coming down. Now, yes, there's wind load, but we don't talk about that uh, for the flying buttresses. They are there to contain the nave so that it does not collapse downward. We have an arch with two straight segments instead of something fanciful like the gallery of machines here, which were curved, but we'll cover the curved arches also. But let's start with the simpler case, which is what we like to do with this course. And we have a left pin, a straight left segment going up to the crown, and we have a right pin. We have four unknown reactions, but notice how nicely this follows our discussion of the beam with the internal hinge. This is a slanted beam with an internal hinge. That's what it is. And remember, if you have an internal hinge, you have to have four unknown external reactions equilibrating it. And the giraffe on ice makes this perfectly clear. If there's a pin on one side and a roller on the other side, the legs will roll outwards and the giraffe will collapse. There are gravity loads on this. They are distributed along the length. Don't worry about that too much. Sometimes engineers distribute loads along a horizontal length. Sometimes engineers distribute load along the axial length of the member. It will be obvious what to do because the loads are given to you in these studies for this course. You don't have to come up with the loads yourself unless I ask you to, and then it doesn't, you know, it doesn't matter, right? What you come up with. But here I'm giving you the load as distributed along the axial length and it's 100 force per length, whatever country you're in in the world. The left pin, the right pin, and the crown, which is an internal hinge, all of these are defined by me, the designer. And you could think of these as meters if you want. So it's a pretty big space, an A-frame type space. Okay? But later we can curve these arch segments and all of the principles are identical. But I want to keep you from getting nervous, to keep the fear factor low. So we'll have straight segments. Now, what do we want to do? We want to find the external equilibrating reactions. And it doesn't matter which one, you're going to do all four. So let's just pick one of them. And here, what did I pick? the vertical reaction on the left side. How do you know I picked the vertical reaction on the left side? Because I perturbed the left support vertically. Only vertically, only vertically. Remember, you are allowed to violate only one boundary condition. All other boundary conditions must be respected. Here we are in the modern method the fully modern method, the answer will approach truth with a capital T. Once delta is small, 
I'm willing to wager, and I'm not a gambling person, but I'm willing to wager that many engineers would be a little concerned about solving this problem quickly if we were to ask them, you know, an engineering student, a real engineer, of course, can can solve this by asking a robot to come up with the answers, which is what we do in real life. But with the Mueller-Breslau method, there's one interesting thing. And the reason why I brought up the algebraic challenges that a student might have with this one is that those challenges are translated by analogy into a challenge geometrically. You are not responsible for the algebraic solutions at all. I, I discourage them, in fact. But the challenge algebraically is that you have two simultaneous equations. You end up with two equations and two unknowns. That analogy in the geometric solution that I will show you is that you have two arc lengths. One of them is centered on left prime. One of them is centered on the unmoving right. And where those two arcs, where those two arcs intersect, that's the new crown. Now that's a really cool idea and it's worth I hope a low respectful whistle from somebody, but it's also worth a few sketches, literally sketches, not with this thing, but go to the coffee shop and sketch something on the little serviette that they give you with your little espresso. Sketch that out and see what is he talking about? Or take two coffee stirrers, lift up one coffee stirrer, and then hold the other coffee stir and wiggle them at the coffee shop to find where is that new crown. It's a really beautiful geometric solution to simultaneous equations. That's what we're doing. If that freaks you out, sorry, it's not hard. You're going to love doing it. You will literally love doing it. In this slide, I talk about the chord length, and I hope that's not confusing. Chord, C-H-O-R-D. What I mean is the shortest distance, the shortest distance from this point, for instance, to this point. That's a chord. Now, the chord coincides with the arch, because I gave you a study of an arch with two straight segments. But what if you wanted to study this structure? What is the chord? The chord would be the shortest distance from the support to the crown. Those are the ones, those are the coffee stirrers, these chords, those are the coffee stirrers that we will rotate without changing their lengths to find the new crown. See, I could even sketch it just, you know, super coarsely. That's the answer right there. I will ask you to do it precisely though, because we're pretty precise people in the architectural engineering department. So I'll show you how to do it. I think you're going to really like it. Uh, this is a terrible drawing. I, I wish I would have redrawn it, but I didn't. Uh, I moved left to left prime and I drew a terrible straight line. And I call that radius one. And right is unmoving. I actually changed the color there. And I drew a circle of radius one and a circle of radius two, a full circle. But I'm just showing you a piece of those two circles and where they intersect. That is the new crown. 
Let's walk through the PowerPoint really quickly, then we'll switch to the computer program. Uh, I, always, I set up the left support to be at zero, zero, because I'm a linear sort of guy. I moved left up vertically, purely vertically, because I only violated one boundary condition to get left prime. I made the original left a ghost, so it, you know that it's no longer there. And then I created a circle of length one, length one being that first radius that I just described, centered on left prime. And I put a dot out there somewhere, it doesn't matter where, because that's not the crown. You cannot guess where the crown is, the new crown. Then how do I get those lengths? Well, that's another uh, really important idea that I want you to look at here. I, I told you earlier that I specified the location of the left support, the location of the crown, and the location of the right support. I'm thinking like a designer. I designed that space for programmatic needs. Maybe this is a badminton court, and there are some seats here uh, and people screaming, or a squash court. Perhaps it's a squash court, and people are playing squash. No, it's got to be a badminton court, because I need the height. Uh, I don't need 16 meters for squash. But the point is that I prescribed these locations. But a builder is going to say, well, wait a minute. I put this thing on a truck. I don't care you know, where it is, just, I got to figure out how, how long that arch piece is because I'm putting it on my truck and bringing it to Hershey, Pennsylvania or something, right? So thinking like a builder, I need these lengths. So you could prescribe the length and then make the points work out based on the lengths, or you could prescribe the points and make the lengths work out based on the points. If you prescribe the lengths, then I think you're thinking like a, a builder, you have to carry this thing out to the site. If you prescribe the points, you're thinking like a designer, and you say, okay, contractor, just make it work, right? But you can't do both. You have to do one or the other. So I think the easiest thing and the most elegant thing is to think like a designer, put the points where you want, draw some segments and let the robot figure out the lengths. There's no difficulty with that. The robot's not even in a union. You don't even have to worry about overtime. Just let the robot figure it out. So that's what I did, 17.2. 12.17, you could change the number of decimal points that you want. Then I ghosted the original arch. I perturbed the left support. I drew a circle around left prime of radius 17.2. I drew another circle around the unmoving right of radius 12.17, boom, I found the intersect. I hid the spurious point. The new intersection up here, that is the new crown. We can put some loads on here. It doesn't matter what the loads are. You could put a concentrated load on, which is a little quicker, or you could put a uniformly distributed load along the length. Or if you're daring, you could put a uniformly distributed load along a horizontal line. Anything is fine. Just come up with some loads. Here I used 150 force per length as my uniform load along the axis of the member. And uh, then I found the equivalent concentrated loads. So perhaps it's a good time to switch to GeoGebra our uh, robot. I have 
a pro uh, a program that I wrote for this presentation. And you could see, you know, one of the steps that I was working on, but I want to go back to the, the basic idea. Here's the unperturbed shape. Perturbing, perturbing. How do I find those perturbed shapes? Just through a series of circles that I described earlier. There's the first circle uh, and there's the second circle. And you could see I hid the spurious intersection. That's the new crown. So it's pretty quick uh, to come up with these circles. It's a, like I said, a beautiful way of, of solving simultaneous equations, okay? So let's save this one, I guess. Let's start all over again, like we like to do. Well, at least I like to do. I, I keep saying we like to do. I don't know if you like any of this because I don't see you. This is an asynchronous experience. I'm going to say we like to do this. Here we go. What's the first step? You know the first step. Left is zero, zero. Don't forget to fix it because you don't want to wiggle it. Since I'm here, I may as well change the color and the style. Okay, that looks great. Couple of choices for Delta. You could put a point on a vertical line. Uh, and I don't know if I've ever shown you this, but you could just drop it right on the axis right there. And it's glued to the axis. And then delta would just be the distance between the two. So that's kind of nice. I will now hide the axis and hide the grid line. And I will rename that segment as delta. Beautiful. Let's go back and put the grid on here and the axes. Let's do something that we haven't done. Let's put a big hinge right here. <laughs> now, why did I pick that point? I just drew it right there and that's where it is. And I'm going to make another point right here. Doesn't I was pretending to think about it, but I wasn't thinking about it. My original arch is here. I got to make that a hinge, sorry. That's my original. This is immediately going to become a ghost. This will stay unmoved, so we'll leave that there. Let's organize these by object type. And you can call this left stick if you want. That's a terrible name, but let's just call it left stick. And we'll call this right stick. Two sticks. I can display the values, but there's really no need to do so. Uh, I will just refer to left stick, not length of left stick, but simply left stick. And I will draw that circle. Now I can hide this and hide this. Let's draw a circle. Let's call that left prime, first of all. And let's call that hinge. So I was thinking like a designer and really carefully dropping it there and there, right? But obviously there was some thought about why I put hinge where it was. The first circle is centered on left prime and its radius is, everybody together, left stick. Perfect. 
The second circle is centered on right, on moving right. And its radius is right stick. Find the intersection between these two circles. There's a spurious point. Let's rename that as hinge prime. I think I called it new hinge in the PowerPoint, but you could call it whatever you want. Hide the circles. We're in great shape. That is the final shape. Didn't take long at all. Let's hide these values. We don't need them. Okay. How's that looking? Looking good. If you had a concentrated load on one of the arches, if you had a concentrated load on one of the arch sticks, how would you find where that load is on the perturbed stick? And I gave you the harder one, which is the left one. How would you do that? Lots of choices. Trigonometry is not one of your choices. I think the easiest thing is to draw a segment from left to that point. Call that radius one or something like that. And then draw a circle of radius one centered on left prime. That seems really easy to me. You know, nothing we do is really easy, but that seems like the least painful way of doing it. How's that? Instead of easy, it's the least painful way. Let's call that radius one. And then I draw a circle centered on left prime of radius one, and it should just be visually obvious that those two are analogous. If that doesn't satisfy you, what you should do is test your script. And remember how we test scripts in this class. We wiggle things around to see, well, that looks pretty good. And don't tell my computer science colleagues that that's how we test scripts, but that's what we do. We just do this and yeah, that looks great. Right? That convinced me that it's perfect. If there was a distributed load on the left stick, where would the concentrated force on the perturbed stick be? I think you know the answer on that one. It's at the, what's the mathematical term? Centroid, the balance point. If it's a uniform load, the balance point is halfway along the length of the stick, hopefully intuitive. So that's another way you could do it, but only for these uniform loads. For the concentrated loads, which drop somewhere on the arch, you need to recreate that somewhere. Where was it? For the uniform load, you could just say, well, I'm just going to get the midpoint on the left stick and the midpoint on the perturbed left stick. And that's it. Um, if you still don't believe me, I'll hide this and I'll call it, um, oops, I'll hide this. I'll make a new segment just for fun, just to keep you satisfied. The one in the middle there that's saying, I don't believe you. Let's call that test radius or something. What if I make a circle of test radius centered on left prime? You in the middle, are you holding your breath? There it is, it's perfect. I don't even rehearse these videos. Can you believe I did that so boldly? I did. You know I don't rehearse these videos, right? Okay, the right side is way simpler because there's an unmoving center. So let's just drop a point. Suppose there was a concentrated load somewhere here. 
then we don't even have to do the radius. We could just simply draw a circle with center through point because the center is on moving. And then I can get the intersection here on the perturbed arch. There's my test. Everything looks so good. That's a nice test also. I'm self-congratulating again. I am. It looks pretty good to me. So if you have uniform loads, just get the midpoint uh, uh, on the right stick. Easy peasy back and cheesy. Right there. And you know that's the same as what I just did. You know that. Here, I'm going to prove it to you. That student in the middle of the class there is still shaking his head saying, I don't think I believe you. Well, no, I just proved it. Okay. What are the lofts? Everybody knows what the lofts are at this point. I think we should put our axes back on just because we could grab uh, horizontal lines. I will grab a horizontal line here, 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 and here. Maybe that's too many. Uh, let me delete that. Too many notes, Mr. Mozart. Too many notes. What's the vertical loft? It's this. You know how to do this. Let me move that over. Boom. Boom. It's no fun if you don't say boom. I'm using really ugly points here. I need to change that. It's just disturbing me. You can hold multiple points at once using the control button and make them a little more palatable. I like four, one, two, three, four. That's a nice size for me. Looks okay on the, even on the phone over there. Let's just change these points right now so I don't have to do that again. Four. And a segment here. And what are we going to call that? Uh, loft left or loft one, doesn't matter, something. And again, we don't have to measure that. We could just refer to it. Alternatively, we could say it's the Y value of load point left prime, for instance, minus the Y value of load point left. Now, I hope some of you have uh, remembered that I always said it's the Y value of the perturbed point minus the Y value of the unperturbed point, even if the unperturbed point is at zero. Remember I said, don't hardwire that zero in there. And this is why. Just get in the habit of saying that the loft is the Y value of the upper point minus the Y value of the lower point. That doesn't take long, and it's a little cleaner, more elegant programming. Look at you getting all elegant and in your programming, right? <coughs> How cool is this course? Oh, I just self-congratulated again. Okay, loft is looking great. What's the loft on the right? I think you can do it, but I'm going to hold your hand. I will draw two parallel lines. I had that before, but it just got a little cluttered. And a dot. Hopefully my dots are behaving. Yes, they are. And a perp. A perpendicular. An intersect. What are we going to say? Boom. That was a, a weak boom, by the way. Hide everything that is 
not necessary, put in this little segment. What do you want to call this segment? Well, you could call it whatever you want, but don't call it R, segment R. That's a terrible name. So you can't call it anything you want. It should be called loft right or loft two or something like that. Something that you will remember. And then finally, we are a hop, skip, and a jump away from finding the unknown left vertical reaction. Multiplied by delta. Is it plus or minus? Is it plus or minus? I did not draw the arrows, but you know the loads are going down. Are the lofts going up or down? Everybody together. The lofts are going up. So both of these cause negative work on the left-hand side of the equation. They will cause positive work when we bring it over to the right-hand side of the equation. So right now I will say minus F left, loft left, minus F right, loft right is equal to zero. And then my unknown is equal to, we want to use parentheses, F left times loft left plus F right times loft right divided by delta. And I didn't put any numbers in here. I didn't put the forces in there. I didn't actually program this, but you will, you will program this. So you will put in an uh, some force, either as a uniformly distributed load, becoming a concentrated load, or in fact, a concentrated load. Let me brag a little bit, um, and I don't brag a lot, but, well, I guess I do. But um, if you could put a load on the hinge here and ask your engineering friends how they handle a load on the hinge, and they will scratch their head saying, oh, we got to do this thing where we move it a smidgen to the left or to the right. And you will say, Pah, we don't do that. We just measure the loft. So if you had a load right on the hinge, that might be a fun exercise. Uh, all you're doing is measuring the vertical loft of the load. Now, there's all sorts of reasons why your engineering friends would have to move it slightly to the left and to the right. And those reasons have to do with the two equations, two unknowns. But we wave our hands and we order another espresso and, and we're really feeling super confident about the modern Mueller-Breslau method. You don't have to put the beautiful polygons in, but I would be so sad if you didn't. You could even put the hatching in so that it's vertical, just change the angle of the hatching. You don't have to put the arrows in, but again, I will be so sad if you don't. They look so good. They're actually not just visually terrific. They are instructive because when you come back next year or five years from now at your class reunion, you come back. Or when you're a grandparent bringing your grandkids. I remember when I was your age. You, you'll say, oh, yeah, I, I know exactly what I did, right? And if you don't have that visual cue, you might not remember. So some of these programming hints, these drawing hints are for you, not for me, but for you, so that you can trigger some memories and say, I know exactly what I did here. Uh, I think I did all this where I'm verifying for that student sitting in the middle of the room here, the skepticism that that student expressed about 
finding the midpoint or drawing a circle via a radius, which is a little longer, but absolutely necessary if that point is not in the middle of the element, then you must establish that radius. If the center is unmoving, then you don't have to establish the radius. You could draw a circle with center through point. I think I did all that. I did that. We're done. So what is the summary? Again, we do not stretch elements. All the elements are rigid lengths. We perturb one single boundary condition, one violation only. Everything else has to be respected. All of the elements remain straight. They are rigid. How could you bend something that's rigid? Did you think about that? Why do I call them rigid? So they don't bend or shorten or elongate. Make delta quite large then make delta quite small. So what I'd like you to do is just recreate this study. Uh, two straight legs, don't make them curved yet. Let's just knock this one out really quickly. Oh, I do say uh, put some uniform downward load along the entire arch. Uh, I think that's a great exercise. If you want to add a concentrated load, like a scoreboard over your arena, those are heavy, right? Those those big jumbotrons, um, they, uh, they are typically on the wall, but you know what I mean, the scoreboard, the speakers, the lights, those are heavy. You can do whatever you want. Uh, find either the right vertical reaction, why did I do that, or the left um, I wanted you to do all four, but I didn't ask for it. So you could just do two, just do two. You could do a horizontal if you want or vertical. I think the simplest thing is to do the verticals because I walked you through it. The right side is just the opposite. You perturb right to right prime and you march along exactly like we did before. One neat, tidy, document. Uh, it's always fun to see a little bit of creativity. So if you really want to make this like a sports stadium or a train station or something with people and seats, that's that's always fun. We call those entourage in, in the architecture studios or scale factors. If you took my history class, you know exactly about the scale factor, the people and then there's one special scale factor, but you don't have to do that. It could just be two sticks, but I want you to have fun. Can you tell that I want you to have fun? How many people tell you to have fun in college, right? Or uh, maybe they do, but not your professors, right? Somebody else might tell you that. So have fun. I'm looking forward to seeing uh, your structures, make them heroic, right? Don't make them like a doghouse, Make them big and, and enjoy the work and take pride in the work. That's really, really important. And use those hints to remind yourself, not to remind me, because I'm not even going to look at your script. I'm going to look at your summaries. Remind yourself of what you did when you come back for the 70th reunion and you're an old geezer like me. Okay, have fun.